Hey everybody, welcome to Church Online. My name is Pastor Wes, my wife Jennifer and I, we pastor here in the downtown Renton area, and we would love to see you come and join us any Sunday at 10 a.m. And just be ready to hang around and eat lunch with us because we serve lunch every week. Um, thank you, thank you if you're a regular subscriber, thank you if you are a brand new viewer, thank you for watching and joining me today. Uh, if you would please click that like and or subscribe button, we are trying to get the word of God out to as many people as possible, and that really helps us get that done. If you would like to learn more about Hope Church Northwest, you can find us online at hopechurchnw.com. HopeChurchNW.com. You can find us and get to know more about us as we would really like to get to know more about you. So thank you again for joining me today. We have a lot to cover. I have seven pages of notes today <laughs> to cover. And so we're just going to jump right on in. Ephesians chapter 4. Some awesome practical stuff's coming out of this week. And so um, <clears throat> before we dive into the actual scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, uh, to partner with today's uh, message, I have a document in the links below. I have a document, a PDF that you can print out online. Um, it is a spiritual gifts test. Now, here's the disclaimer. Uh, this isn't like all of the spiritual gifts you're going to find in the Bible. This uh, this test is the graces, the gifts that we talked about last week, and I believe that it's the closest one that actually matches the fivefold ministry that we're going to talk about today. And so um, if you want to know more about uh, this gifts test, again, the, uh, in the description below, there's going to be a link for you to be able to download this PDF, fill it out. There will be a whole separate, whole other video that describes the answers to each uh, gift and the purpose behind each gift and how it ties in to the Ephesians chapter 4 model of the fivefold ministry. So, okay, with that, let's dig right in, man. Let's get right into it. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Paul says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. Verse 13. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. That is a loaded statement. We'll get to that in a little bit. Verse 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Verse 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This is the word of the Lord. Woo. So much in here. So much going on. So <clears throat> in order to uh, really dig in, we're going to just we're going to start from the beginning. Verse 11. We're going to get back to verse 11. And. The Greek reads differently than the English, okay? So again, the English is, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. That part in English, or excuse me, in the Greek, is not, it's not in there. It's not in the Greek because it is an assumed from verses 7, 8, 9, and 10 that we're still talking about the gifts. We're still, still talking about the graces. And so that part isn't actually in the Greek. What is in the Greek is now some to be. And in front of each office or each gift or each um, grace, we're going to use those words kind of interchangeably today, um, each, and before, before each one, he says, some to be, now some to be. And it reads like this. So now some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be shepherds, and some to be teachers. Right, so let's, let's, Break each of these words down just a little bit. Um, apostles in Greek, uh, ap apostolos. It is a delegate or an ambassador sent on a mission and one who organizes. 
okay? Number two, prophets or prophetas in Greek, a fourth teller or a foreteller or an inspired speaker. Evangelist. Evangelist is basically evangelistas is how it comes out in Greek. It is the, they, this person is a bearer of good tidings or good news and is also can be considered a missionary, somebody sent out with good news, okay? Uh, shepherds, not pastors. A lot of people say pastors and teachers. The actual Greek word is poimena, uh, poi, poimenas, which is shepherd. And this is a protector, a feeder, and a ruler of a group. Protector, feeder, and ruler of a group. That's a shepherd. And then teacher, uh, did a saukalus. I know I probably pronounced that one wrong, but uh, didasalkalist is how it comes about in my mind, <laughs> means a master instructor, that one who knows, a master instructor. And so these are the gifts. So when Jesus uh, conquered death and he led captive in victorious fashion everybody who chose to identify with him, and then he, and, and then remember last week it says that Jesus gave gifts to those who identified with him. And so for those of us who identify with him, we have the potential uh, to have one of these gifts in our life. Now, I, I do want to say this. It doesn't mean that everybody is a part of the fivefold gifts. Now, part of Westology, remember, Westology is just from what I've studied and, and what I think. Um, I think everybody has characteristics of some of these graces, characteristics of some of these gifts. But it doesn't mean that everybody has them. Right, if you go back to verse 11, it says, now some are to be, right? Some are to be. Not everybody, but some. And so he gave these offices, these gifts, these graces um, to his body, to his, his ecclesia, his gathering, his people. And so <clears throat> in verse 12, we actually see that these, these five graces have a responsibility. And the responsibility, the Greek word is this, uh, karta. Uh, car, catar, tisman. There it is, catar <laughs> I'm going to get it. I don't speak Greek. Um, but this word, catar uh, so most people translate it to equip the work, uh, you know, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry is how, uh, how I grew up learning it. But in the Greek, actually this word is used when a doctor puts a bone back in place so that it can heal and become a part of like, and, and be what it should be. Right, so if you have a break in your arm, I don't know if you've ever broken a bone, but when the doctor sets it back in place, or when a surgeon uh, goes in and he, and he takes his tools and he puts something back in place where it should be, that's the word that actually is used here. It's not, it's not equip, it really is to set in place. It really is to, to set in to the place that it should be so that it can operate how it should be, right? Th this is used of surgeons with broken bodies and, and that kind of thing. And so, so the, the purpose of the gifts is to help set others in place where they should be in the body of Christ. And if we roll this all the way back to um, Ephesians chapter 3, when he talks about the body and how everybody's a part of the body, and then it says that Christ is the cornerstone and everybody, you know, everybody's a part of the house. So this picture of Christ putting people where he wants them and where they belong and, and becoming a part of the body of Christ. If you're a thumb, be a thumb. If you're an elbow, be an elbow, right? If you're an eye, be an eye, that kind of thing. Now he's all, he, Christ, is also given uh, these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, excuse me, shepherds, and teachers, the responsibility of putting people in place so that they know their part in the body of Christ. And so as a pastor, as a shepherd, and as a teacher, part of my job is to help you understand what part of the body of Christ you are. And then to prayerfully and, and, and considerably teach you then how to be that part of the body. And so, um, and then in verse 12, it says the saints, right? Uh, uh, Hagion, Hagion, I believe it is. Um, those who are set apart and those who belong to God. Now remember, in Ephesians, the entire time here in Ephesians, Paul is telling the, the Gentiles, you are now, you belong now to the family of God. You belong to Christ, right? Now you belong to God. And so 
when he used the word saint here, it, it didn't differentiate between Jew and Gentile. If you belong to God now, your title is saint. Your title is somebody who belongs to God, set apart for God. And so to do what, right? So, so, so the, the fivefold ministry, the, the offices, the graces given to the church, they have a job of putting back into place those who belong to God. Why? To do the work, ergon, E-R-G-O-N, to do the work, to toil, that's, that, that's what that Greek word means, to toil, uh, in uh, diakonias. Now, for us, it's the work of the ministry, right? That, that's what we say, the work of the ministry. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that the work of the ministry is like preaching and teaching and, and praying for people and, and loving on people. But this Greek word, diakonias, and, and again, I'm probably butchering the, the pronunciation here, but it's a specific word uh, that's actually been, been used before in this culture. And, and especially in the Greek culture, especially in, the, you know, in, in this era, uh, if you use that word, then it was an understanding of one who waits tables, right? One is who is here to serve. So let, let's, let's run this back, okay? <clears throat> I want to read verses 11 and 12 with all of this new defining understanding. And I wrote this paragraph down, so I'm going to read it just how I wrote it, because I want you to see like, let's put an English picture together of the Greek definitions all broken down together. Let's put this together in English. So check this out. Listen. Christ gave his church delegates on a mission to organize people, foretellers to remind us whose we are and, re- uh, whose we are and the reward or consequence of obedience, bearers of good news of salvation, protectors, feeders, and rulers of a group of people, and master instructors to put us back in place where we should be so that we who belong to God will work as a waiter at the table in order to serve others. I know it's kind of weird, right? It like blows your mind when you put all of the definitions back into, uh, into the equation. It's like solving algebra, right? When you solve for X, plug that number X back in and then go resolve the equation. And you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's what this is. I mean, it's a whole different perspective when you see that God gave some people to be delegates on a mission to organize the apostle, right? He gave some to be the voice to say, hey, remember whose you are and remember what you get for obedience or disobedience. That's the prophet, right? Then the evangelist is the bringer of good news, the bringer of salvation. Hey, Christ died for you. He loves you and he wants you back. That's that's an evangelist, a bringer of salvation. And then the, the feeders and protectors and rulers of groups of people. Well, why are you using the word, you know, rulers, Pastor West? You know, pastors, aren't shepherd, uh, pastors and shepherds aren't rulers. It, I'm not saying rulers as in the, the Western idealism of ruler. But yeah, uh, a shepherd has a responsibility to guide and to lead sheep, to guide and to lead people. And so... Yeah, we, we absolutely have some, uh, some part of your life that we are responsible for. And so therefore, <laughs> we get treated and looked at like rulers of groups or like leaders of groups. So if I said leaders, would that, would that you know, not ruffle your feathers so much? Probably. But the actual Greek definition we find in Strong's and when we're doing all of our little discussion uh, and, and digging what we see is, is it's protector, feeder, and ruler of a group. That's what a shepherd is. And then finally, a master instructor. Someone who has the knowledge, who wants to pass on the knowledge, who, who will give you the truth because they have studied it for themselves and they are, they are the, the feeders of truth. Why were all of those given? They were given so that they, those five, can put the wayward people back into place in the body. If someone wants to be a kneecap, but they're supposed to be a pinky toe, it's our job as the fivefold ministry to say, hey, you need to be the best pinky toe that you can be, right? You you cannot be a thumb. You cannot be an ankle. You were designed, you were given the grace 
to be the pinky toe. Why are you picking on the pinky toe, Pastor Wes? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but the pinky toe serves a huge function in the mobility and stability of your body. If you don't have pinky toes uh, on either side, then <laughs> you're probably going to wobble a little bit while you're walking. Uh, just ask somebody without their toes how, how strange it is to try and balance on the balls of your feet, or, or you, you end up turning your feet the other way to you know, place the <laughs> weight somewhere else. I mean, think about it. Every little, every little tendon, every little piece has a part in sustaining and making healthy the body. And that's what this picture is, is that these five people are supposed to say, hey, you are this person, you are this piece, you've been given this grace by God to do this part of the ministry. So put on the apron, grab your server's towel, grab your notepad, and let's go serve people. Let's get to work. And we do all of this. We do all of this because Paul continues in verse 13. We do all of this so that we can become mature. We do all of this so that we can grow in Christ. We do all of this so that the body of Christ will continue to grow so that we can see that person over there and say, hey, you lost in sin, you hurting people, you, you who God loves, come be a part of us. Come be a part of the body of Christ. And this is the, this is the place that you are. Like We need the tendon that runs through the elbow. That funny bone that everybody hits, right? That isn't so funny when you hit it. That's a nerve and a tendon covering that if it's not there, you know. <laughs> because your arm just kind of flops around and does whatever it wants, right? So every part is important. Every part. And so Paul continues here. Because of the gifts and graces, right? These are the purposes of the gifts or the graces of God. Uh, these are the purposes of the offices uh, of, of the Lord here or of the church here. And so this will continue, verse 13 says, until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of the Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Now, um, 11 through 16 is one of Paul's long run-on sentences, right, with commas every everywhere. He's just stacking idea on top of idea on top of idea. This is another portion of that. And so in the Greek, it actually, it, it's, it says this, we see three major distinct areas. So when the, when the fivefold are operating properly, and then the body is being pulled together, this is what we're going to see. Unity and faith and knowledge of God's son, Jesus. A unity and faith and knowledge of God's Son, Jesus. That's, that's one, right? Because when we, when we have more knowledge of who Christ is, then we can become uh, more unified in choosing Him. Unity and faith, right? If we go back to verse 5 of chapter 4, there's one faith. And what did that part mean? That, that meant that everybody chose this one belief, to believe in Christ. And so because of the knowledge of the Son of God that we have, because of the knowledge of Christ, we all will have a unity in that faith. And that's, that's a part of our maturing. That's a part of the fivefold's job is to look for and, and usher in that unity in that faith. Uh, the second thing we see is maturity, right? But the, the, the word for maturity in the Greek doesn't mean like, oh, you know, I'm grown up and I'm all, I'm all wise and I'm, you know, I'm more mature than you and I'm not, you know, I'm not immature. I'm not like a little child, which he alludes to a little bit later. And actually in Greek, it means to all completeness. And let that set for a second. When the body knows where to work and knows how to work and gets ready for work, we see a completeness in the body that we really haven't seen in a really long time, right? So completeness in the Lord. And then finally, we begin to measure up to the standard of Christ Jesus. That's the third thing that we see in verse 13. We begin to measure up to the standard of Christ Jesus, which, by the way, is a really high standard. You see it's off the charts here. It's off the camera can't even touch it, it's so high. It's that maturity. It's, it's that measuring up to the standard of Christ that we see when the whole body works together. Okay, so side note here, side thought here. And let's ponder on this for a second. If you ever try and reach the maturity and the standard of Christ by yourself, 
I, Pastor Wes, do not think it's fully possible for you to reach full maturity in the knowledge of God or the knowledge of God's Son, Jesus, by yourself. Because Paul here says that the, the giftings of God will continue to operate. We will, we will put people in place together so that the whole body can operate and function and we will all have the same unity and we will all have this completeness together. Completeness together, right? So then therefore, we, when we are together is when we begin to measure up to the same standard of Christ. Not when we try and do this on our own. So what are you saying here, Pastor Wes? I'm saying, yes, you may be watching online, and I definitely appreciate you, but you belong to a body of Christ. You belong to some, some group of believers somewhere, and my encouragement to you, my challenge to you, man, my, my, even, even from you know, my shepherd's heart, my protection to you is you'll never measure up to the full standard of Christ without being a part of the body of Christ. So find, find your body. Find your body. Find out where you belong. Man, go plug in. Put on your waiter's towel. Grab your pad. Let's get to work, right? That's what this part is all about. And so then Paul takes us on a lesson here, verses 14 through 16. He takes us on a lesson. Uh, again, this is all one big train of thought for Paul. And so he takes us on this lesson, and he shows us a contrast, Remember, a part of what we will see is a maturity or a completeness. But then in verse 14, Paul defines that incompleteness. And he says, then we will no longer be like immature children. You ever, you ever see a kid get upset for absolutely no reason? You ever see a kid who, you know, thinks that, that, that the sky is green, <laughs> right? You, you ever see a kid who, who just... They want what they want, and if they don't get it, they're just going to fuss and cry and scream and throw a fit. Like That's immature. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of adults that still fuss and cry and scream and throw a fit when they don't get what they want. I think that person needs to be a part of the body of Christ, and somebody, the pastor or the apostle or I don't know, somebody needs to be like, hey, you know, straighten up. <laughs> straighten up and fly right. Like you're a part of something bigger than yourself. This isn't all about you. So anyway, I digress. Let's get back here. We, we won't be like immature children, Paul says. This is the contrast he's setting it up. But we're, we're not going to be immature. We won't be tossed around by every wind of new teaching, right? Um, uh, if, if you think about it, so I'm, I'm going to tell this quick story. So my wife and I took our kids to, um, uh, I think it was Ocean Shores uh, one day, and <laughs> we were running up and down the water as the tide's coming in and everything, and, you know, and I've got one of my kids' hands, and my wife has another one of you know, the other hands, and, uh, the other hand, and, and, and when, the, when the tide was coming in faster than we thought, you know, we were trying to scoop the kids up and get them out of the way because we know that, A, they're not fast enough, and, and B, if the tide hits them, they're, they're not strong enough to not fall over. They're not strong enough to not be taken out by this tide, right? Uh, maybe they'll just fall on their face. Maybe they'll fall on their butt, whatever, whatever. And so the tide, <laughs> the tide was coming in. <laughs> the tide was coming in. And, and unfortunately, um, Pastor Jennifer couldn't keep a hold of one of our kids' hands. And so she slipped and she fell and got her butt wet, right? Got her clothes wet and everything. And, you know, Jen didn't, she didn't run away. She stopped. She picked her up out of the water and all of that stuff. And so, but this picture here Paul, from Paul um, helps me understand that, that unless we are mature, can stand in completeness, uh, we get tossed around by the wind and the waves that come and hit us. Well, there's a lot of teaching out there that is considered a wind or a wave that, that moves people one way or the other, right? This whole progressive Christianity is a, a teaching. Now, remember, who is Paul talking to? He's talking to people who have come from multiple Greek gods. He's coming from people who, are, who, who have been talked to by multiple Judaizers, right? The Jesus plus group, um, or, or, or the folks who are like, hey, remember when you served this small G God? And so now that you're going to follow Jesus, are you still going to follow this other God, right? And, and you get tossed around by all of these different ideas or the different understandings of truth or, 
or, or, or that kind of thing. And so <clears throat> this picture is very, very uh, today. It's very today. That, we, that if we are not strong in our faith, but also if we don't belong to a body who is here to help us and who is here to, like we're here to be a part of this body, then there will be every new teaching and every wind that blows you over and tricks you and lies to you and then you begin to move away from Christ. You know, one of the biggest signs, in, in, in my opinion, in Pastor Wes's opinion, and, and it's my opinion because I haven't seen it not be true, not one time. One of the biggest signs that you have been tossed around by new teaching, by a wind or a wave of the world, is that you stop going to church. You think that you don't need church. You think that you don't need the body of Christ. That, that's not true. <laughs> it's, it's just not true. You, you belong to the bigger ecclesia, right? The bigger gathering, the bigger body of Christ. And, and, and though you belong to that, you don't, you, don't, you don't go anywhere. You don't see which part of the body you can belong to. You don't, but there's this concept of, I can love Jesus, but I don't have to go to church. That's not, that's not sound teaching. That's not sound doctrine. Well, you're just saying that, Pastor West, because you, know, you want people to come to church. Absolutely. I absolutely want people to be a part of the body so that we can come to full maturity together. You cannot reach this maturity on your own. You will be tossed around, right? The end of verse 14 says, we will not be influenced when people try to trick us, right, with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. The, word, the, the Greek word there for trick is kybia, kybia, K Y. B-E-I-A, Kybea, and it means trickery or sleight of hand like a magician. But it also is used, check this out, it's also used when they would uh, cast lots and roll dice to, to you know, uh, get clothes. So like when the, when the warriors or when the Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes, they, they rolled dice. Well, some of them had loaded dice. Some of them could control the outcome. That's trickery, right? That's that they were they were <laughs> they were gambling, but they were they were doing it because they could control the outcome, right? And then the other the other use for the same word is when uh, in the market when someone would would bring something to the scale to know how much to actually you know oh I've got this much food and so it's going to cost me this much money, they they would put different weights on the scales to cheat the people out of the money, to make them pay more money. Same word, trickery. Same word used here. You will not be influenced when people use trickery, when they tell you lies so clever. And that's what the enemy is really good at. He's good at telling you a lie that sounds just enough like the truth. That some of us just take it hook, line, and sinker. Which is a fishing term, by the way. <laughs> some of us just take it, and we run with it. And I got to tell you, with all the love in this pastor's heart, in this shepherd's heart, that that's it's wrong. You 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 just don't you don't understand when you believe uh, this much lie, but this much truth. It, it it's just it's wrong. It's hard. It's it's the only tool that the devil has is lies, and too many of God's people, too many people in general, but especially too many of God's people. That's why Paul is talking here to God's people in this contrasted idea is so many of us are just so immature because we've removed ourselves from the body or because we just don't, we don't want to believe the whole truth because it's just so hard to swallow or so we're immature and then we don't see the fullness of God and we don't see the maturity we need and we don't measure up to the standard of Christ. And then in contrast, Paul in verse 15 starts, he sets up the contrast by saying instead, right? So this, instead of this, it's, that's the contrast. We will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church, right? Speaking the truth in love does not mean gossip. I'm gonna say that again for the folks in the back. 
Speaking the truth in love does not mean gossip. It, it does not mean that you can tell someone what you want in order to manipulate them because you're calling something truth. That's not what this means, right? Let's take the Greek fullness and definition. Speaking the truth in love. Okay, truth is a foundational term in Greek. It's a foundational term. There is no other word for truth but truth. And it means, it means the truth. It, it just points to doing truthful things, being truthful, right? Having a fullness of truth. But when we speak this truth in love, that word love is agape. And remember a couple of weeks ago, we said that agape is, means that there's nothing anyone can do that's going to make us not want the highest good for that person, right? There's nothing you can do that's going to make me want anything but the best for you. That is agape love. So when we are speaking the truth, we must do it in a way that we are doing this for their good and their benefit, not for ours. There are too many folks out there, unfortunately, who use the truth in love as a way to cram their truth or their idea or their understanding of truth or, or you know, I just don't like what this person's doing kind of truth down somebody's throat. And, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, if that's happened to you, I'm sorry. That is not what it means. That's not how this works. When we speak the truth of God's word to someone or over someone, Right? We are seeking the highest good for that person to be a part of the body of Christ. That's the purpose behind speaking the truth in love here in verse 15. And then finally in verse 16, Paul says, He, Christ, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts to grow. So pause real quick. As each part does its job, it helps the rest of the body to grow. As each part does its job. As each part does its job. Now, each part could be the five, or it could be each part of the whole body. I think it's each part of the whole body. Each part of the whole body does its own work. It, the body, the, the, the people, we help everything grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of agape, full of love, right? And, and so this last verse I want to... I want, I, want to, um, I want to be extremely careful with this, and so here's my disclaimer. Um, there are definitions of normal bodies and abnormal bodies, right? And uh, one, of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite actors growing up uh, is Michael J. Fox. And uh, watching interviews with him as of late has just been very, very difficult um, because I've seen this as a picture of, now again, this is, this is totally metaphorical, so don't, don't get your feelings hurt and don't think I'm talking about Michael J. Fox. I, I, I think he's a pretty great guy, or at least, you know, for all of his struggles and the, the things that I know uh, uh, that I have read about him. <laughs> I think he's a pretty great guy. So, um, but there's a huge difference when, when, you're, when you're seeing him be interviewed by somebody with a quote-unquote normal body. They sit there with poise, in control of muscles, the whole body's working together to get this interview done. And then they pan the camera. And then they show you Michael J. Fox, who with Parkinson's, you lose control of parts of your body. You lose control of the muscles and some of the ligaments and tendons and, and just his constant, you know, moving and, and, and you know, the hands. And I, I, I love and have taken care of a guy in, in South Louisiana with cerebral palsy. Again, it's a, it's a disorder, you know, in the brain that cripples the body and cripples the muscles and they don't, they don't form properly. And Paul is saying here, Christ makes the whole body fit together perfectly so that... When each part does its special work, when each part works the way it's supposed to, the body grows healthy and full of love. And so the picture that I want you to see, the picture that I have here, is when Christ is the head of the body, when, when we are underneath his headship, when we are underneath his lordship, we see the body act as it should. We, it acts normally. The ligaments are controlled by him. The thoughts are controlled by him. The actions are controlled by him. It, the, from, the, from the top down, everything just works. 
But unfortunately, I think the body of Christ, the big C body of Christ, has actually been acting a whole lot more like a body with Parkinson's. There's this one church over here who just kind of does, you know, what it wants and they're doing over. And then this one over here is doing something totally different. And, you know, and then and you just can't keep still. And again, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just saying you you see the disjointedness, you see the disconnectedness, you 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 see the fact that 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 not everything's working together the way that it's supposed to. And it's just this perfect picture of how, and, and Paul painted it. He, he painted this perfect picture that, that when we remember that Christ is the head and the brains behind the rest of the body, when we, the fivefold ministry, when you recognize your, your grace that he's given you to operate, when you recognize if you, if you have a part of the fivefold ministry, ministry offices or the fivefold calling whatever whatever you want to call it right the office the grace the gift if you're a part of it then you have the responsibility of saying hey i'm going to take these people and i'm going to help you find where you belong in the body of christ and then we're going to we're going to put our boots on and we're going to grab our serving trays and we're going to get out there and serve we're going to get out there and we're going to see the body of Christ come to a unity in faith. We're going to get out there and we're going to see a completeness like we've never seen before in the body of Christ. That is the picture that Paul is painting here from 11 to 16 in chapter 4. And so I want you to be encouraged because that means you, you watching today, you have a part in the body of Christ. And so you need to ask yourself, but you should also ask the Lord, hey, Father, how did you make me? Do I have some of these characteristics? Did you grace me with any of these fivefold? And if so, show me. Show my pastor. Uh, show my family and then put me to work. Put us to work, right? So before we pray, I don't want you to forget, I'm going to have this spiritual gifts test uh, up and running. Like it's going to be, the, the link is down in the description. Make sure you get this copy. It's a front and a back. And then there will be a second video that actually tells um, what each grouping is. Now, there are seven groups, um, but these seven, I've, I've put two of them in because they're very specific gifts that I think benefit the body. Um, but the rest of them all parallel to these fivefold here uh, in, in, <laughs> in, in Ephesians 4. So um, with that, let's go ahead and pray, uh, and then we will close it up today. Thank you again for joining me today. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gifting that you've given everybody. Thank you for the grace that you have given people. And Lord, if we fit into one of those fivefold, if we are a part of that team, then show us, please. If we are not a part of that team, but we are still a part of the body, Lord, help us have both humility and desire to want to know where it is that we fit. And help us learn where we fit in the body and how to pull up our, get our serving tray, put on our towel, and let's get out there and serve. Let's, let's find this unity and faith. Let us find this, this togetherness, this completeness in you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is the truth that we can speak in agape for the highest good of everybody. Lord, we love you. I love you. Thank you, thank you for being such an amazing God, such a gracious God, someone who gives and gives and gives and gives, and, and we just thank you for that. Continue to uh, put this word in our heart this week so that we can reflect on it. Uh, we love you and we honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you for joining me today. If you've continued with me this long, make sure you hit that like button. Smash that like button. Let us know um, uh, what you thought about it, and then it helps us get the word of God out there. If you have yet to subscribe, please do so. Uh, check the links down at the bottom in the description. The spiritual gifts test will be there, but also the highlighters that I like to use and the Bible that I use. And so when we're reading together, when, when I'm preaching and we're reading together, we could be reading the same book. We literally could be reading the same Bible. And so uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you again for hanging out with me. Uh, I appreciate it. We'll see you next week.